for clicking on this video today we are going to be looking into solution and uh, solubility and for us to start this i just want us to have a little recap from uh, matter matter is anything that has mass and can occupy space and matter is described under three substances which are elements and we have compounds and we have mixtures and what we actually mean by element is a pure substance that consisting of only one kind of atom and example of that is uh, sodium calcium aluminium ion and we call that metal because they are able to release electrons during their formation of ion and we have non-metals non-metals include sulfur nitrogen fluorine carbon they are called non-metals because they are able to accept electrons while forming ions but we have another one that is not metal not non-metal we call it metalloid which is exam which is uh, having uh, in between properties like metal and non-metal. Examples of that are silicon, germanium, polonium. For metals, we normally see them in on the periodic table at the left-hand side and uh, transition metal side or transition block. For non-metal, we normally see it at the right-hand side of the periodic table. And the metal is actually the division that divides the metals and non-metal. What about compounds? For us to look at compounds, we really need to know that compounds are pure substances consisting of at least two different kinds of atoms chemically combined or two different kinds of elements chemically combined. Examples of them are inorganic compounds like salt, acid, base, oxide, hydride, and we also have organic compounds like carbohydrates, proteins, fans, and oil hydrocarbons and for us to say that this is inorganic compound it means that there is no direct carbon carbon link or carbon hydrogen link and for whenever we have it as a carbon carbon link that is a direct carbon carbon link or direct carbon hydrogen link we say it is organic compound what about mixtures and uh, when we look at mixtures mixtures are substances consisting of two or more atoms physically combined and we have something like suspension we have something like colloid we have something like solution for us to say that something is suspension we need to understand that this mixture that is called suspension is a heterogeneous mixture of undissolved particles in a given medium but when for us to say it's colloid it means that it is in between suspension and two solution so we need to define what solution is in order for us to have a better idea of what colloid is by this my statement for us to say that something is a solution it means that it is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances so colloid is going to lie between suspension and solution that is just a simple way of putting it although i still have uh, a simple way i try to differentiate the three at the same time because sometimes they can actually ask you to make a difference make differences be, uh, among the three therefore solution if you're looking at the particle size the particle size is less than one nanometer what i mean by one nanometer is one times ten to the power minus nine meters this is one to hundred nanometer for colloid for suspension is more than hundred uh, nanometer it means that with the uh, with our eyes for solution, we will not be able to see the particle. Colloid, we will not be able to see the particle. But for suspension, our eyes can see it. It means that it is very, very visible. Now, the visibility of it will cause the scattering of light for colloid to, uh, to be. But for suspension, we are not going to have any scattering of light. Rather, it is going to block the light rays from passing. At the same time, they lead to uh, the inability of our eyes to see that of colloid make it to be cloudy somehow yes it will be cloudy somehow but we cannot perfectly say that this thing is cloudy because the way we are seeing it it is in between solution and suspension so we do have confusion in that if you are looking at filtration it can actually pass through filter paper or colloid suspension cannot pass through it solution can pass through it and example of solution is salt solution when we come to colloid, we have mayonnaise, but there's something I want you to have in these types of colloid. We have fog that is gas in liquid, we have emulsion liquid in liquid, we have salts or aerosols liquid in solid, we have smoke gas in solid, and we have foam, what we mean by liquid in gas. This foam, I just want you to remember when you are washing the foaming of your soap is actually liquid in gas. That's an example of colloid. And mayonnaise, milk, solution can actually serve as that, including your butter. Your butter can actually serve as example of colloid. Your uh, toothpaste can also, also serve as example of solid. Now for suspension, we have muddy water. So since we have a little understanding of this, let's go proper to solution because that is actually what I told us we are going to be studying. But I just want to bring in some other ingredients to help us to understand this. Solution, mathematically, I present it as solute plus solvent. 
What I mean by solute here is any substance that is able to dissolve in another substance. And what I mean by solvent is that particular substance that is serving as a medium by which another substance disappears in. So we have something like this. Most ionic substances will dissolve in water. And something like naphthalene iodine will dissolve in ethanol. Paint dissolves in 2 pentane. Rubber dissolves in benzene. So if you look at this, Disappearance of solute in solvent actually means what we call dissolves. So when I say disappeared in solvent, I'm actually trying to tell you that it dissolves in the solvent. So I want you to know that this idea of solvent helping solute to disappear has been made use in chemistry, in cleaning. In this clean, we have something like removal of oil by petrol. And we also have preparing of vulcanizer uh, solution, where we have uh, rubber being dissolved in benzene. We have perfume in ethanol. What, why we are using perfume in ethanol is that ethanol is very, very volatile. That means that it can behave like a gas. When you spray it, it will move farther away. But the perfume ingredients cannot do that. So we dissolve the perfume ingredient, which is organic matter, inside ethanol. They have sweet smell. So when we spread the ethanol, the ethanol move and move with those perfume property. That is why we are making use of the solvent. So for us to be able to make good use of this solution, we have the good idea of the solvent and have the good idea of the solute. So we have types of solution. I group solution into two. I have one to be physical and the other to be chemical. For me to say that this type of solution is a physical solution, it means that the interaction between the solute and the solvent results to physical change. So no new substance is formed here. But for me to say it is a chemical solution, it means that the interaction between the solute and the solvent to form solution is actually as a result of chemical reaction. So new substance is formed here. For that physical change, the example of that is like sodium chloride dissolving in water. We will still have sodium chloride in water. But sodium dissolving in water will not have sodium in water again. Rather, we are going to have sodium hydroxide and evolution of gas, hydrogen. So this evolution of gas hydrogen shows that there is a chemical reaction taking place. But this uh, sodium in water, there is no evolution of gas, nothing, nothing happened, and the salt is still there. I can recover it just by heating, and the water will go, and I will still have my salt. Is a physical solution. And when if, whenever we are dealing with a physical solution that has the solvent to be water, we call it aqueous solution. And I still further divide um, physical solution into unsaturated solution, I have saturated solution and supersaturated solution. For us to say that something is supersaturated solution, it means that it contains more solute than it can dissolve. For us to say it is unsaturated, it means that it contains less solute that it can dissolve. That means that it still needs more solute to dissolve in it. But for us to say that something or a solution is saturated solution, it means that it is still capable, it is no longer capable of dissolving more of its solute at that particular temperature. And here, there is a dynamic equilibrium between the undissolved particles and the dissolved particles. Or we can just say undissolved so solute and dissolved solute. So there is going to be a dynamic equilibrium. So the undissolved will be dissolving. And the one that is already dissolved will be coming out and be forming crystals. So there is going to be a balance uh, there. But the balance is going to be a dynamic equilibrium. And the amount of the solute that dissolves in a saturated solution at a particular temperature is its solubility. So I can actually give solubility as the amount of solute in mole or gram in a saturated solution of the solute in the solvent at a given temperature. You have to get that in your head. But I have another way of defining sol solubility. I say that solubility is the degree of interaction of solutes and solvents in a solution in a given temperature. That is what I define uh, solubility to mean. And there is there are factors, there are things that can help this interaction of solute and solvent to occur. We have it as nature of solute and solvent, temperature of the solution or system, pressure of the system and solution. In your textbook, they will write it as something like factors affecting solubility, and they may explain it into so many ways. Uh, 
solid in liquid, uh, liquid in liquid, gas in liquid. So I'm just going to use this to discuss the three. So I want you to know that point one and point two, that is nature of solute, temperature of the solution is for solid in liquid and also liquid in liquid. But point one, two, three is for gas in liquid. So let's look at the nature of solute and solvent. What I mean here in nature of solute is actually uh, how does the solvent interact? How does the solute interact? What is the type of bond that we can see in the uh, solute and the solvent? Does the solute have polarity? Does the solvent have polarity? Because if it has polarity, it is possible they will dissolve in water. And also, it also means that it can dissolve in other polar solvents. But if that solvent, if that solute does not have polarity, I mean here, if the solute has pole, like positive charge, negative charge, it is highly possible that it will dissolve in solvents that is polar. But if that solute is non-polar, it may not all that be easy for it to dissolve in a polar solvent. A simple polar solvent we normally use, we call it a universal uh, solvent, is water. It is actually called a universal solvent because it is a covalent compound that has polarity and can dissolve more sol solution and can dissolve more solute than other solvents. So this is why we refer it as a universal solvent and it's actually the most common compound on earth and most common solvent on earth. Anywhere you go, you must have water and you drink it every time. And uh, this polarity actually affects the way interaction or, or the degree of interaction of solute and solvent. Temperature, if you increase temperature for endothermic solution, you are actually increasing the ability of the solute to dissolve in that solvent. But if we are dealing with gas, if you increase the temperature of a gas, you know you are giving it high kinetic energy, the ability to move away. So it will be moving away from the liquid. That is, if we have a solution that is gas in liquid, something like carbon four oxide dissolved in water. So if you increase the temperature of this solution that has carbon four oxide in water, you are giving the carbon four oxide energy to move away or escape from that liquid. So you are decreasing the solubility of carbon four oxide when you increase the temperature. Look at this. If you increase the temperature of endothermic reaction, you are increasing the ability of that solute to dissolve in water. And if you decrease the temperature, you are decreasing the ability to dissolve in water. But if you do that, if you increase the temperature of gas in liquid, like carbon four oxide in water, if you increase the temperature, what you are doing there is that you are decreasing the ability of carbon four oxide to dissolve in water. Let's go for pressure. If you increase pressure of a gas, what you are actually doing there is that you are increasing the ability of that gas to dissolve in water that liquid or water. For us, the, the, uh, I need to understand what happens here. According to Boyle's law, if you increase pressure, you are reducing volume. And gas uh, particles, actual volume is negligible. So how they occupy the volume is negligible. If the volume space there is small, they can be there. But if they know there is still another space they can occupy, they will go in there. Now, for instance, if you have carbon four oxide caught inside the liquid, they will just be staying on that uh, peripheral of the liquid. But if the pressure is now increased, where they do not have much space again, those gas will enter inside those liquids. And when something is entering inside those liquids and disappear, we actually call it dissolving. So we are seeing that if you increase pressure, it is actually going to increase the ability of that particular uh, gas to dissolve more in water or in that solvent. So we go for solubility formula. When we look at solubility formula, I have something here. I have solubility in, res res uh, in respect to mole. I have it as mass of solute over molar mass of solute times volume. Mind you, this mass of solute over molar mass is something as mole. So we can actually write it as mole over volume of the solvent. If we are dealing, the dealing with the solubility of mass, that is, we want to use mass per DMQ. We can use as mass of the solute all over volume of the solvent. So note that mole is the same thing as mass on molar mass. Please grab that idea. It's very, very important. So I want us to look at solubility curve. 
In this solubility curve, uh, what I mean by solubility curve here is a curve showing the effects of temperature on solubility of a solute. So let's have a little interpretation of solubility curve. I just have two I want to look into in this diagram. One is sodium chloride. You see the red line moving from between 30 and 40 and it couldn't be able to reach 40. What happens here is that if you increase the temperature, it does not have a strong effect on the solubility of sodium chloride. Now, let's look at barium uh, nitrate, the green color. If you increase the temperature, it gradually increases the solubility of barium nitrate. Let's go for cerium tetra or the surface is nanohydrates. So the cyan color that is moving between 20 and 10. So if you look at it, if you increase the temperature, it is actually reducing the temperature. So at 100 degrees Celsius, the least soluble substance there is cerium. You can see it at, it's the lowest down there. The highest probably might be that of pink color sodium, the sodium, the other sodium salt there. Now there is another sodium salt that I want to comment on, uh, the blue color, the blue color. Is, as the temperature is increasing, the solubility increases. But you reach at a point, the solubility starts to decrease. The, sometimes they will ask you, why is it so? The reason is that sodium tetrahydrosulfate cis salt can form hydrated salt. So as the temperature is increasing, it is forming hydrated salt till you reach the maximum value. When you reach the maximum value at that above 30 degrees Celsius, as you increase the temperature, that hydrated salt will start to break. The hydrated salt will start to break. So that is what happened. The solubility is breaking down because it is no longer, it's no longer having much interaction with the water. That is what happens there. So I want you to have this little idea here. We are going to be looking on calculation or in the next video. Thank you very much for clicking on this video and don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to like, don't forget to share the link to your friends and ask them to join and watch this video. Thank you very much. And remain blessed. I wait to see you in the next class video where we are going to be dealing with calculations and solubility.